silent or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via live online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Anyone in the ga gallery is welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. They can connect to the Assembly Wi-Fi. Password details are available on the gallery rules. It is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Okay, members, agenda number one then. Agenda item number one is apologies for Mr. Dallet. No other apologies? Okay. Agenda item two is the minutes of the meeting of the 27th of February, which are at pages six to 11. Are you content with those minutes, members? Great. Great. Permission to sign them. Um, so, members, at last week's um, meeting, the Controller and Auditor General Kieran Donnelly was asked to cost the total overspend of the 11 major projects as reported in the Northern Ireland Audit Office Major Capital Works Report up to 19th of December 2019. I can advise the Committee that Mr Donnelly has now provided me with and the Committee with the overspend figure, which is a total of £692 million. Pounds. There is a breakdown of the figure in your table pack at pages three to four. Now, members, at this stage, I am happy, to, if members so wish, that Mr Donnelly and his team can come to the table and members can ask questions if that is what members so decide. So what's the view of members? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Can we ask Mr Donnelly, please? Welcome, Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Controller and Auditor General for Northern Ireland, Mr. Tomas Wilkinson, to the committee. Um, Mr. Donnelly, we, the committee has just been um, made aware of the figure uh, that's in the pack today of the overspend of the, the 11 projects up to the 19th of December uh, 2019, a figure of £692 million. Pounds. Uh, Figure, I know that your team last week talked a figure in around £700 million. Pounds. So that is confirmation of that figure. I think that is a huge amount of money, stark figures indeed, for the public purse in Northern Ireland. And when you put in context that the current finance minister said only a couple of weeks ago that there could be a potential black hole of £600 million pounds in the current budget, and the cost, therefore, of the overspend and the opportunity cost of that £692 million pounds and what it could have been spent on is something which is stark uh, for all of us as taxpayers. So, members, I am open to uh, questions if any members would like to ask either of our two witnesses at this stage any questions on that figure. Mr Hilditch. Thank you, Chair. Very welcome, Chairman. Uh, during your investigations and the overview into some of these, has there been something consistent in relation to those figures? Uh, some issue that has sort of been consistent in, in each project, which has caused there's such a horrendous uh, over overspend. And to be honest, we've now moved on a few months, so we're now over 700,000. Looking at some of the figures, which have, I know in my own head have been updated recently. So, is there anything that can uh, there are different causes, Chair, in, different, in cause. different cases. Uh, I suppose that's something that the committee will probe into. Uh, in our work, I suppose, we, we compared uh, initial cost for each project at outline business case with uh, the final cost of the project is completed. If it's not completed, uh, the latest estimate of, of, the, of the final cost uh, and I suppose uh, in some cases, because there have been enormous time lags uh, from the outline business case, part of the reason will be because of the course of time and inflation. 
But I think what all of this does demonstrate is the crucial importance of getting the, the figures that outline business case as precise as possible, because uh, it's at that stage then bids for, for resources come in. So if, if something's under costed, uh, you know, there's a, an opportunity cost there. A, a project might beat another project that is uh, more fulsomely costed. So I think there is the issue of making sure that uh, there's as much precision as possible built in at that, at that early stage. Yeah, and those, those figures include the optimum buy as well? Um, that would have been built into the, uh, the slow line business case. Yes, yeah. that does include that yeah. figure? Mm -hmm. no what it would I be. believe so, yeah. yeah. Some of the work obviously hasn't started in a lot of these and they're already overspent. Is there, is there problematic issues at the outset? Well, 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 some of the biggest variances are, of course, on say, road, roads projects that haven't started uh, and, and because of legal challenges, etc. So that, that's a big contributory factor. In other cases, such as the University of Ulster, mm -hmm. it, the, the overrun is on the, on the construction side. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you're very welcome once again. Uh, I just want to ask you, you, you may be able to answer this question or not, maybe give the committee some direction. Um, depending on who responsibility is, I'll, I'll put it as responsibility in the delay. Um, who, do you think, who do you think should be responsible for the, for the cost then if there's a a delay, say, by the department or because of a judicial review, or have you considered any of that in, 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 in any of your findings or, or uh, any consideration? Well, in general terms, I think one of the things that's important is to consider how accountability could be sharpened, uh, both at individual project level, uh, but also in terms of the whole system. Because uh, I think uh, some of these problems are bigger than just an individual project. So, uh, uh, and today is probably an opportunity to actually look at the, the more systemic issues that straddle the, pro the various projects uh, uh, and what can be done at the central government uh, to improve things generally, as well as sharpen accountability project by project. Okay, Mr. Biggs. The, the uh, lengthy delays in many projects and many modifications that have happened along the way because they may not have been um, precisely identified during the tender stage, um, is that not a, a, a gift to the builder? Because um, I understand builders generally go in very competitively and make money on the alterations. So is there a problem in the way that we are uh, seeking competitive tenders so we're getting the best value for money because of the delays and uh, modifications along the road? Well, I suppose there are the, 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 the delays that are happening on the project will always give rise to um, you know, big cost overruns and the um, when, when the plans have to, when if they at the outline business case stage of the project, if they have plans have been made properly, then and that has to be amended going forward as a result of planners or judicial reviews, that all increases cost. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious as to how accurate is the new cost that's come up with? Is it the, you know, how, how is it agreed? Because it's bound to be very subjective. The new cost. Yeah. In some of these cases, I suppose it'll be more accurate than others. Ones that have actually begun, it'll be you know hopefully the departments will be relatively accurate. But there's some of these cases here. Um, are quite some way from being completed, and you know the costs of those <coughs> may well not be. You know, it's the, it's the department's best guess at the moment, mm -hmm. but you know that that's, <coughs> that said won't change. I think I think the other thing is that um, Mr. Hillage is probably right. I think at this stage we're probably three months after the figures that you've produced very kindly for us today. We're probably now over seven hundred million pounds in the light of the. The, the uh, outline business cases which have been mentioned by both of you. Do you think there's a sy systemic problem of these outline business cases being produced and tenders going in that are not realistic to secure works that are therefore not going to be delivered on time and on budget? And this now seems to become a culture in Northern Ireland in terms of public sector contracts. 
Uh, it's something to be very alive mm -hmm. to. Now, we have no firm or direct evidence in this report of that. Uh, that said, I'm aware that, uh, that that type of risk isn't unique to Northern Ireland. Uh, I suppose uh, Comptroller and Auditor General in London had been making points about this last year uh, on, on really the importance of not gaming the system where you know bids are put in that are undercosted uh, in the hope of getting through and then getting more money further down the track. So it's very, very important that those that are reviewing outline business cases test for that very, very thoroughly. <coughs> but I have to say I have no direct evidence of sure. that in, yeah. in, in these particular cases. But the key, the key, one of the key learnings and finding, findings out of all of this is that outline business cases should be accurate and, and should be um, precise to try and ensure the maximum amount of money being spent in the public purse for the maximum return of investment and, and infrastructure that's put in its place? Uh, well, any outline business case will be based on assumptions, uh, so there should be sensitivity analysis around those assumptions uh, with various scenarios, worst, best case, uh, but not a, a, just an optimistic case. Okay. Mr. McHugh. Yes, well, effectively, it was on the same line as well, too. And I was going to ask the question just do business cases tend to be optimistic in terms of costing and timing? And time, yes. Uh, well, well, I think the figures here would imply that they are. Um, yeah, because in the, okay. each of these cases, they haven't, they haven't met either cost or timing, or in most cases, both. Uh, and the two will tend to go together. If something's running behind, uh, the cost will inevitably go up. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Flynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, when, when you were um, researching into this, did you look out for any trends that would be linking to departments, aside from you know, like the overall procurement and tendering process? Was there any trends? I notice, I know on this list we're only looking at the 11 projects, but health seems to feature a lot, um, and maybe possibly communities. But d did you take a steer on that in that sort of sense? You know, where maybe it's it could be a problem that are a fault line at departmental level at the beginning of the process. Um, I suppose what you're driving at are some departments better, better, this better than, yes. than others. Uh, and uh, what I would say is where projects are standard in construction, uh, the track record will tend to be better. So say on schools projects where the design features are very consistent, there is better performance. Uh, where the system sometimes falls down is more in the ad hoc or quite unique projects or departments that are not normally involved in, in big projects. But uh, other than that, it is difficult to generalise and there are you know, problems here across the piece. Different types of problems, uh, some at the construction level, others earlier in the process. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, members. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, members, before we proceed um, from our uh, other invited guests this afternoon, I just want to address a couple of things in terms of the issues that were raised last week in terms of the raise uh, briefing that we had from Colin Pigeon. We asked Mr Pigeon to explore efficiency savings that CPD could make similar to that which had been made in Scotland and the Republic of Ireland from the centralisation of procurement uh, services. Mr Pigeon has come back with the following information from a recent CPD report, Collaborative Procurement Annual Update, dated the October 2018. The 69 contracts awarded through CPD between the 1st of April 2014 and the 31st of March 2018 have achieved total cumulative savings of £20,600,000. The cumulative figure includes actual savings delivered through contracts awarded during the period. However, I should point out and stress that these are mostly small service contracts and not major capital investments, similar to those that we're talking about in this inquiry. Okay, members, are the members content with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, item four, then, members' declaration of interests. Um, members at each of the meetings, we are required to register 
relevant financial or other interests. Um, does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Okay. Item five then is correspondence. Um, members, in your table pack, page six, refer to an email from Mr. Chris Murphy dated the 4th of March 2020. Mr. Murphy is requesting a breakdown of the timeline of £11 million added to the cost of the four kilometre section of the A6 major roads project, Vandals Town to Castle Dawson dueling system. Members, are you content to forward this correspondence to the Northern Ireland Audit Office for clarification on the points that Mr. <coughs> Murphy has raised in his email and also to write to Mr. Murphy requesting that he forwards the evidence he refers to in his email on the 4th of March 2020? Mm-hmm. You content, members? Great. Yeah. Great. Chair, I just, is that, a, that uh, document now public? Well, it, it's not in the public domain in, in the sense that, uh, as far as I'm aware, it was, a, it was an email I received which I forwarded on to the clerk, which then obviously has been um, submitted to you. I'm not aware if uh, it's been made public by the person who sent it. Uh, I got a copy as well Yeah. Okay. by email, so yeah. in a regard it was being okay. public. So the, did, he, did he say in the correspondence, I, I can't remember what I read, but that it, he'd already been and had a meeting with the audit office? I think he, I think he had a meeting with the audit office this week, yeah. yeah. I mean, silly us referring him back there again, but is that the process just yet? Yeah, well, we have to, we have to I mean, I, until I received the, the email, I knew nothing about this, so I, I mean, we have to furnish ourselves with information. So the, the process would be that... Mr. Murphy, having written to me and to other members, clearly as Mr. Lund has indicated, that we would then have to write to the audit office to seek the information that we wouldn't have as a committee. Ms. Flynn. Um, yes, I just want to ask a question. Um, I received the same email on Wednesday, um, so just a wee bit of guidance. Would you respond as chair of Public Accounts Committee on behalf of all members yeah. who received the email? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think, I think I have received a copy. Yeah, I Mr. B- so I take it everyone has received a copy, yeah. have they? Yes. And I was just to uh, raise the query to this isn't subject to judicial review at the present time. I, well, is I'm, it? Not, I'm not going to go into any of that until we write and get information at this stage. Right. Okay. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Okay, members. Uh, okay, members, we will remain in open session for the next two agenda items. Uh, item six then is the inquiry into the major capital projects uh, evidence session. Uh, members would like to invite to the table f- for the inquiry Mr. David Sterling, head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, Sue Gray, accounting officer for the Department of Finance, Mr. Des Armstrong, chief executive of Construction and Procurement Delivery CPD, Department of Finance, and Brett Hannan, chief executive of the Strategic Investment Board. Members, I refer you to the pen portrait of the witnesses on pages 14 to 19 of your information packs. Uh, and also, Mr. Cairn Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General, and Mr. Tomas Wilkinson, Director, are also available to answer questions members may have. Members also in attendance are Mr. Stuart Stevenson, TOA, and Ms. Julie Sewell, an official from the TOA, who are available to answer any relevant questions members may have. Members, for this briefing session, you have the following papers in your table pack and referred to Northern Ireland Audit Office report on major capital works, pages 20 to 113. Members, please refer to your confidential pack, the yellow folder, which you received at last week's meeting as agreed in closed session last week. And the areas and subjects in terms of questioning will be as follows. See table pack, page 8. Okay. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Chair. Uh, Sterling. Gray, Mr Armstrong, Mr Hannan, uh, thank you very much indeed for coming along. Uh, and I don't know whether each of you are going to make, make some, some remarks or uh, someone going to lead on behalf of your delegation. Um, I, I was going to say just okay, two or three very quick things. I'm not okay. sure if my colleagues want to say anything at the start, but uh, no, Chair, just we welcome this opportunity to discuss the challenge of delivering uh, major projects. Uh, I think evidence from around the world shows that major projects are intrinsically difficult to deliver and that as many as 8 out of 10 fail to meet their time and budget targets. Uh, We welcome the contribution of the uh, Audit Office report, um, which the contribution it makes to the debate about how we can actually reduce the risk of uh, budget and time uh, excesses. Um, we agree with the two recommendations in the report, and we also welcome the CNIG's proposal to conduct 
two further studies into the lessons to be learned from the judicial review process and also uh, a review of the efficiency and effectiveness of the Northern Ireland planning system, which we think will be really helpful in this regard. Um, I wasn't going to say anything more uh, by way of introduction, and I don't think any of my colleagues are going to add it. Okay, thanks. Um, we have just received a, a briefing from uh, the uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office, which indicates to us that there may be an issue uh, around um, outlying business cases in terms of the accuracy of those, the preciseness of those, and the, the efficiency of those. In other words, companies may well be in a position of putting in contenders for public works of the scale that we're talking about here, these, particularly those 11 major contracts which are sizable investments by the Northern Ireland Government. Um, how can you all assure us that the outlying business cases that are submitted are actually accurate and deliver value for money uh, because they clearly don't deliver um, contracts on time and on budget? Um, okay, I, I'll start with that. Um, and obviously, I think we, like everybody in this room, regret the fact that uh, projects haven't come in on time and on budget. There's a very helpful uh, table in the uh, Audit Office report at 3.2, which uh, sets out some of the reasons why um, the projects which have been identified uh, haven't, as I say, um, achieved their time and budget targets. Uh, and um, I'll not go through those now, but I think it would be useful to go through some of those factors during the afternoon. But as far as business cases are concerned, um, this is one of many areas where we're continuously seeking to uh, improve things. Uh, and the Department of Finance has uh, currently um, is in the process of introducing a new approach to the production of business cases. Uh, this follows agreement by the Northern Ireland Civil Service Board last year that we should look at this, and the new arrangements will come into effect from the 1st of April. Uh, I'll turn to Sue, maybe could uh, just say a little bit about what the new process is and what it's designed to achieve. Thank you. So um, we have uh, tried, I suppose, to streamline uh, the business case process. Previously, it would have been a 10-step business case process. We've gone to five. Um, but what we've tried, I think the old model was probably overcomplicated and lots of appendices and everything. So what we've done is we've set it out in very clearly defined headings. So we've got the strategic case, the economic case, the commercial case, financial case and the management case. And underneath those, we're actually um, asking departments to set out very clearly uh, the objectives, the ex you know, we get an expert advice where we need it. So it will actually be, um, there's greater clarity on roles and responsibilities under this new case. Um, this five case, this five step business case is actually being used by uh, the Treasury, by in England for all their cases, Scotland and Wales, and actually internationally as well. So it's, you know, we've moved to, a, I suppose, a clearer process. Uh, requiring departments to be very clear about what they are doing. And I do, you know, the point about, I suppose, getting costings more accurate at the outset is a really valid point. And, you know, sometimes uh, cases, you know, schemes go forward with on the basis of not as detailed a cost assessment as we would like. So we've actually been doing a lot of training around this, training of our staff. And uh, although we agreed this probably about six to nine months ago, we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to get everybody ready to implement this new case from the 1st of April. Can I just ask, in terms of what you've just said, and schemes going forward and perhaps the necessary work not having been done, yeah. that's, that's very alarming for, for a public accounts committee to hear. Not, not, not necessarily being work, not necessarily being not done. Um, what we're actually saying is you've got to be actually now explain things very clearly. Um, you know, if you need if you need expert advice, we will get the expert advice, and there are these stages that everybody's got to go through. I could actually, I'd be very happy to send you yeah, the five case but, model. Yeah, no, if you could do that, it'd be very helpful. But could, could I just ask, for the benefit of of, of the committee yeah. and the record today, what schemes are you talking about? That that, that uh, in terms of the reference, can you give examples that they they weren't precise in terms of going forward? 
No, I think I, I actually haven't got any examples with me. I suppose it's just that this will make sure that we actually have all the information that we need to make the, the proper judgments. But it is alarming to, to, to hear that in some of these cases mm. that schemes went forward without that being in place. Because well, if, if what will now be a figure of over £700 million to the public purse in Northern Ireland, because these figures were dated the 19th of December 2019. So we're now two months and just into three over into the third month of the new year. That figure will be over £700 million. Given that your minister, Ms Gray, said a few weeks ago in the chamber that there could be a black hole of £600 million to the public purse in terms of the, the, the budget, that draws attention to what, in terms of the overspend, in terms of cost, but it also makes me think of the opportunity cost. What could that £700 million have been put into in terms of infrastructure or investment in hospitals, in roads, in transportation, in schools, that, that wasn't because this money wasn't effectively and efficiently spent? I, I, I actually didn't mean to say that. I actually don't know. I'm not saying that there were £700 million that actually no, no, could have been... No, but we have, we, have asked, we have asked the Audit Office and we have got a figure of, of £700 million pounds of, of overspend or lack of efficiency that, that allowed that to, be, to become a figure. I think it was 692 in December would now probably be uh, £700 million. Pounds. I think um, if we're looking at the reasons that underpin the £700 million pound figure that you quote, Again, the figure 3.2 that I referred to uh, helpfully identifies the reasons for cost overruns. And clearly, there is an issue around the accuracy of outline business cases. I'll maybe ask Brett to say something just about uh, the SIB's experience in that regard. But certainly, if you're looking at the factors that have contributed to cost overruns, like in our view, um, there is definitely an issue around uncertainty over mm -hmm. funding. Uh, and in that regard, we haven't had a multi-year budget since 2011. Uh, we've had a six series of uh, single-year budgets. We've been in a period of austerity where there has been little real terms increase in our budgets over the years. Um, we have seen unforeseen planning issues arising in a number of the cases that are referred to there. And in that regard, I welcome the Audit Office a proposal to do some further work on the efficiency and effectiveness of the planning system. Uh, we have seen legal actions being taken which have uh, slowed up the delivery of major projects. And again, I, I welcome the commitment to look at lessons to be learned from judicial reviews. Uh, we have seen quite significant tender inflation over the last 10 years. And it's worth noting that in the four years from 2010 to 2013, there was actually a, a cumulative a reduction in, of 15% in tender prices. But then in the eight years from 2014, projected to 2021, we have seen tender price inflation of 56%. And in the three years from 2015 to 2017 alone, tender inflation was 36%. So that has had a very significant impact on the cost of projects as well. Um, We've also seen um, the uncertainty over long-term funding and the impact that it has had on our ability to uh, finance projects, uh, having consequential difficulties for the construction sector, uh, some of which um, were described to this committee um, by a representative of the Construction Employers Federation uh, last Thursday. So um, there, for each of these cases, there have been a different range of factors which have given rise to the costs. I, I think our view would be it wouldn't just be down to difficulties with constructing an accurate outline business case. And, and, and maybe, Brett, you, you, you looked at this area and maybe could, could add something to that. No. Um, I think the starting point uh, has to be that these types of project, major projects, are inherently risky. And they run into similar problems right across the world. They have the longest schedules which makes them most vulnerable to changes in requirement and scope. They're the most expensive, so they're the most vulnerable to procurement challenge by disappointed bidders. They're the most complex. 
They place the greatest demand on other systems, such as planning and procurement. They're the most innovative. Uh, they use non-standard designs that haven't been tried before. And they're the most impactful. So they're most likely to generate local opposition from citizens who are adversely affected. And there's a long list of projects in the public and the private sectors in other jurisdictions that have accounted for similar problems. And academic studies show, as David has said, that nine or eight out of ten of, types of, of this type of project have a cost overrun. Um, and the study that um, I've been reviewing recently shows that such overruns were found across 20 different countries, five continents, and were constant for the 70-year period of the study. So the conclusion from that is that cost estimates have not improved anywhere over that time. So if we should expect problems, um, what are the key issues? And the first is obviously how to improve the accuracy of those cost estimates. And then secondly, what can be done to reduce that inherent riskiness? Um, the first starting point, I suppose, as to why estimates are too optimistic is because there is an incentive to underestimate costs at the evaluation stage just to get the project started. By playing down costs and boosting benefits, projects will appear more attractive in competition for scarce funding. Mm. Secondly, it's in everyone's interest to get the right, in inverted commas, answer. Um, elected representatives and officials want quick results. Builders and consultants want work. Taxpayers want action. And this subconsciously or consciously incentivizes those charged um, with creating and assessing business cases perhaps to accept optimistic estimates and lower optimism bias requirements. And finally, there is um, a lack of symmetry between the information held by the promoters of projects and the assessors. Um, misrepresentation or inaccurate estimates are often not identified because the people carrying out the assessment haven't had the required information. And the number of projects where the sums allowed for optimism bias to take account of this that have been demonstrably insufficient, that is to say the amount allowed for optimism bias hasn't been large enough, um, clearly shows that the system um, right across um, all jurisdictions isn't working properly. So to pick up on Sue's point, um, how can you deal with this? And she's explained about the five-stage business case, um, which has been brought in uh, in England and elsewhere uh, and is uh, improving this. And it might be worth if you wish, going into a little bit more detail how that can be done. The first thing is the expertise of the people carrying out the assessment. Um, as I said earlier, there's currently more information in possession of the people promoting the project than there is um, being held by the people assessing it. Under the new arrangements that Sue has described, the assessors will have access to external, independent, objective advice coming from experts who are not going to be conflicted by the hope of future work, such as the consultants that helped with the original drafting of the business case. Secondly, we're going to begin using reference class forecasting. This means um, taking, uh, recognising that statistically the best guide to the cost of a project is the cost of a similar project somewhere else, and that, that's what's called the reference class. And you would adjust that where necessary for differences in scope size and other relevant factors. And this produces a much more targeted form of optimism bias. At the moment, the bias is set centrally in London at a particular figure that doesn't take particular account of the specific circumstances of a particular project. Um, and again, that will be carried out and assessed by an entirely independent <coughs> and objective assessor, free from political or any other pressure. As a result of this, we can start to capture performance data and use it for benchmarking. Uh, and this can identify weaknesses and anomalies, and we can ask questions such as, why do we regular underprice this part of the project or this activity? Um, and once we get data and can collect it, which is specific to the area that we're working in, um, then we can start making our estimates based on actual historic performance rather than predictions of what costs should be. And then the final thing I draw attention to is the intention to evaluate the performance of both forecasters and assessors. Um, once we have data for each project, the performance of those that write the business case and the performance of those that review them can be evaluated, um, and those that perform <coughs> well or badly can be identified. And I think if you take those actions together with mm -hmm. um, the stages that Sue described, there's a much greater likelihood of reaching um, an accurate figure for the cost estimates. Can I just ask, in terms of the 
I think you mentioned, Sue, about moving from 10 steps stages to five. Uh, and obviously that has been set out in more detail now uh, by Mr Hannam. In terms of the, uh, those steps and in terms of the uh, measures that you now plan to put in place, can you assure us that uh, those controls will be in place to prevent this from happening in the future? Because it's not a one-off. It's not a one-off um, project that has gone wrong here in terms of the finances. It's 11 major projects that have overspent and cost the public purse, as I've said, £700 million. How can we be certain that this won't happen again? And I know that they're unforeseen, and I know there are difficulties with certain projects, but people could be um, excused for thinking this is systemic. In public contracts, large public contracts. So I think, you know, this will, um, I think, as Brett has set out, be a more... It's a very robust process, and it will be, uh, you know, very tran you know, transparent. Uh, but I think that you can never, you know, unfortunately, you can always, you know, try to do your best. But there, you know, if I look at, uh, you know, uh, my former colleagues uh, who are, who've done a lot of work on this in Whitehall, um, you know, there are still major projects that actually, despite the best will in the world, through unforeseen circumstances or whatever it is. You know there is uh, they they are still coming in, uh, you know over over budget and taking longer and you know we've all read recently about HS2, and yet so they've put in a lot of work a lot of this uh, you know these strong foundations and the infrastructure projects authority is working in a very you know it works in a a very good way supporting departments with a lot of the skills that they need yet still uh, the you know projects will depending on their complexity. So I'm afraid I can't say uh, never. Um, but what I think this will do is I think it will, um, you know, it allows us at the various stages to do the challenge that is needed, to uh, bring in experts where needed, um, and to have, you know, to have that discussion and that challenge function. So I think that mm. this will allow us to do that. Um, but I think that there will always, you know, unfortunately... I think I couldn't say, otherwise I think you'd have me here again. I think the key thing is it will allow for a more balanced management of risk. And I think that's perhaps what has been <clears throat> lacking in the past. Uh, and we're very keen that um, at the outline business case stage, when you're first looking at a project, that we want to just make sure that people aren't unduly optimistic. We want to make sure that assumptions that are made are as accurate as possible. <clears throat> but at the same time, we don't want to create any uh, risk aversion, um, such that we are so worried about getting everything absolutely right at the very start that we have a delay in the yeah. project, which can itself lead to uh, an increase in cost. Could, could it be the case that when you talk about uh, outline business cases and people being unduly optimistic, um, could, we, could it be the case in some of these large contracts that we have a culture that is built up, people being unduly optimistic? And putting in tenders that are not realistic, and then cost the public person. I, I see you nodding in agreement, Mr. Armstrong. Just, Do you want yeah, to? I think well, we I, I, I suppose uh, as an observer of the system right across the system, um, it's clear to me that there are a number of cultural issues, I suppose, that play as well as as the the technical aspect of it. Uh, and the National Audit Office have come up with a number of studies that suggest that things like entryism, where you know if you allow the, a project to get into a program. Uh, not properly or realistically costed, then the culture doesn't allow it to be stopped, you know, that you have to continue with it. So that's almost like a cultural thing. Uh, and then to, to sort of put your reputation or the programme or the project on the, the idea of a, a single point estimate, I think, is, is unrealistic because the world changes as time goes on. And therefore, you have to keep going back to the assumptions that you've made that established the, the original estimate, and that needs to be continuously looked at. And then there's the issue around vested interests, because human beings or organisations become very involved in making sure that the project goes forward and is delivered. So you, you have that mix of things that are in there. But in terms of the business case approach, I think separating the commercial uh, issues out of the business case assessment will be very useful, and I would expect that organisations who are not involved in the in, in these projects um, can come in with a fresh view and actually start to challenge some of the numbers that would be in play. 
And I think that that's, that's a significant, in my opinion, a significant I think, issue. I think what we all need to see coming out of this, though, is that the scenarios you're talking about are the exception rather than yes. what appears to be the rule, and I do say what appears to be the rule in terms of these projects. Well, I, th I think these, I mean, these, these are large projects, and, and to a certain extent, you know, my organisation hasn't been involved in them, but below these projects, there's an awful raft of other projects that are carried forward uh, quite successfully. <coughs> And the, the previous committee looked at how DECAL was managing its capital projects and made reference to the fact that, you know, there's technical ability in SAB and in CPD to support departments as we do that. And coming out of that review, um, you know, we put quite a bit of effort in CPD to upskilling our staff to make sure that they were professional, that they had the qualifications to go in and help organisations and to some extent challenge. And, it's, you know, that's, I think, something that should reassure us if we can get the commercial business case to work properly where we recognize that these projects are different from smaller projects which are important very important still to do but we have another system that says actually we want to be a bit more certain about what we've committed to do and we want to look at those estimates as the project goes forward um, and if we are stopped for any reason we really have to have a bit of a rethink because in construction projects, although a project might stop or stall, the costs do not stop and stall because inflation runs and continues to run. So, yeah. in my view, the significance of, of drawing out the commercial case is one I think can, can help and assist and make sure we try and get these projects in a good place. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Mr. Sterling, you mentioned was I think planning is a problem. And, it, and obviously it's a particular problem and all of us in our constituency work will have, will have in, encountered that as well. But when you, when you talk to investors who are coming here uh, and they, they continually tell you there's a problem with planning, in terms of the, the projects we're talking about, three of them in particular, Belfast Transportation Hub, Casement Park and the Primary Care Centre at the Royal Victoria Hospital, all encountered and have encountered and continue to encounter difficulties in terms of planning. I, I'm not, I know you, none of you are the Permanent Secretary in terms of infrastructure, and I'm not, we will be speaking to the Permanent Secretary and should be giving evidence in the not too distant future. But is there more that we can do in terms of Northern Ireland PLC to ensure a, a, a more robust, swifter system, not setting aside people's legitimate concerns, but allowing us to get to the point where we can actually be, be, be on site and start to deliver projects on time and on budget? I think this is important, and I, I've already said we welcome the proposal by CNIG to do some further work in this area, because there's no doubt you look at, uh, again, the list of projects, and several of them, as you've identified, Chair, have been beset with planning difficulties. Um, and it'll be useful just to get some empirical evidence to suggest whether there's anything that we are not doing here that we should be doing that would make the planning process simpler. But I think it is worth recognising that unforeseen things can happen. You, know, like you, you saw the, uh, the court's ruling on Terminal 3 at Heathrow Airport last week um, has clearly created a major issue, which a very sophisticated and a very large um, organisation had not anticipated, but is going to have major implications not just for the Heathrow Airport, but perhaps for many other people as well. And I think this is the, goes back to the point I was making, is we need to balance risk. On the one hand, when people are looking at projects, they need to anticipate all possible planning issues and avoid them. But we don't want people to become so risk averse and look to, to, you know, to identify every potential planning pitfall and then lead to a position where things don't really move at any significant pace. And I think that's where uh, more work will helpfully be done to make sure we get that balance right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr Lund. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and afternoon, everybody. Uh, question for yourself, Mr Armstrong, first of all. And it, it may relate to Mr McMahon as well. The, the Construction Employers Federation are very strong in their belief that the, the procurement process, that one of the problems with the procurement process is due to the lack of consistency across the public service, public sector. The various COPEs, different procurement bodies, bespoke solutions, confusing the industry and causing unnecessary duplication. Would, would you accept those points, first of all? I think I would. 
I think I would accept that um, that uh, we've, we have failed to be consistent in our approach to the construction industry, and as a result of that, the industry can't deliver the efficiencies that we want it to, or, nor can we help the industry perform as it should. Uh, we have spent quite a bit of work uh, and, and time trying to bring together common conditions of contract, common specifications. Um, but inevitably, if you have a number of organisations who uh, have their own board of directors or their own governance arrangements, they will tailor uh, the documents to, to suit their particular organisation. I think that's one of the challenges that, that uh, certainly uh, if a recommendation came from, the, from this review that we, we really do need to get into that space that uh, certainly my organisation would be very willing to look at how we could harmonise the documentation. We work with the industry quite closely in, in trying to identify common issues, uh, issues of mutual interest. And you know, I get that feedback regularly that we're not consistent. And the industry has said that if, if, if government can set a standard that it wishes to have from the industry and standard of performance that it expects, then the industry will come come to that. And I think I would have to accept that you know, that's, that's a, a bit of a failure that we have at the moment. Okay, um, this might be for yourself, Mr. Hahn. They, again, the Federation argued very strongly at centralisation in the procurement process, to put it simply, would result in a reduction of duplication, lead to a more consistent approach across all public sector bodies, and uh, would make better use of limited resources and result in a more consistent approach to procurement policy and practice. Um, I think you've been on SIB for over eight years, is that right? Well, you'd be familiar then with the report in 2013, another review which was uh, conducted by yourselves, which, which to me made sort of similar points. And I, I do wonder sometimes about these reviews and reports right, right across the public sector, which seem to, and I've been on this committee since 2001, I don't know, 2007, sorry. And uh, you, you always come back to this, that reports don't seem to have had any real effect. Do you think that the report, the review that you did in 2013 was acted on? And if, if, it, if it had been, would we be having, talking about the same topics now? Well, uh, clearly it wasn't uh, implemented in full, and the audit office report um, sets out um, why that was. Uh, the benefits of centralisation, um, which was recommended in that review, um, were, I think, explained by the CEF2. Um, the benefits include being able to concentrate scarce expertise um, in one place, uh, having flexibility in deploying that expertise, uh, taking a standardised approach to procurements, including having standard contracts, um, fewer bespoke clauses, uh, reduce the costs for bidders uh, having to go to their legal advisers, um, by bringing projects together across departments, it's possible to um, consider the use of hubs where different government uh, organisations share the same premises and to thus optimise land use. It makes it easier to collect and report data and benchmarks. Um, it can avoid lumpiness in the pipeline and allow more flexibility in the use of a budget. Um, it can use its buying power to encourage industry productivity improvements, such as um, promoting the use of BIM and modularisation in standard parts. Uh, and as the CEF said, it provides a clear interface with the market and clear accountability for delivery. So all of those things are possible um, through centralisation, but they're also possible without centralisation if um, it's not uh, uh, acceptable for one reason or another to, to deliver it, those benefits through centralisation, but they do require a lot more effort. Um, the, the great advantage of, of centralising, as has happened in um, uh, instances such as Infrastructure Ontario um, uh, and others, um, is that they. What was that one, sorry? Infrastructure Ontario. <coughs> it's an example of an organisation um, that uh, centralises the commissioning and procurement of infrastructure. Um, in the Ontario area of Canada, All right, okay. um, and it's managed to deliver um, it was a cool large part. scale <laughs> projects uh, very quickly. Yeah. He's hoping to get a site visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, I think you're making a point that uh, all that you've just read out is lifted from the 2013 review, yep. but we're still seem to be talking about the same things. 
there seems to be the way of, of government, to be honest. You know, we don't seem to move on. I can think of reports from other departments where mm -hmm. same thing. I think in fairness, um, there has been quite significant change since 2013. Okay. The um, proposed centralisation didn't happen, and there wasn't ministerial agreement to that. So we'll set that to one side. But certainly, departmental restructuring, the reduction of departments in 2016, has meant that um, major projects tend to be handled by the Department for Infrastructure um, and uh, Department of Finance. Obviously, has uh, assumed responsibility for health estates. Uh, and that means that all health projects are being dealt with in the same way. So whilst we haven't centralised everything into one area, there is a much greater concentration of expertise in a smaller number of departments, and I think that has had an impact. And like, for example, um, uh, Sue and I have both recently been at Macabre Prison, where there's a very new prison, which again was delivered by um, CPD. Um, and you know, at the cost of £48 million, on time, within budget. But that is being done Garvey. on behalf of the Department of Justice. It can be done, so like you. It can be done. And a number of health projects as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, other things as well. Um, we have invested quite heavily in improving programme and project management practices. And again, if you go back to figure 3.2, you know, Ten years ago or more, there would have been major issues with procurement and uh, um, practices, but they are not being cited as a major reason for the difficulties with these particular projects. Now, and, you know, we can maybe during the afternoon discuss some of the, the detail around the improvements that are being made by CPD and by SIB as well in that regard. So, there, there's a lot has been done, okay. uh, even if that key recommendation was not implemented in full because there was no ministerial agreement to it. Okay, um, thanks for that. Mr. Humana, back to yourself. Um, there, there's anecdotal evidence that many construction firms prefer to bid for work across the water or elsewhere from Northern Ireland at the moment. Um, and the, I'm thinking particularly about the, the Strill campus where there was only one bidder came forward. So, why do you think that's happening? I mean, the Strill contract, what was an offer there? Six schools. I would have thought developers would be queuing up for a job like that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's like six major contracts in one site, but yet only, I think, two came forward, one dropped out, if I'm right. So, why do you think that's, that's happening? Because I'm, I'm looking at your, um, one of your aims and objectives here, and you, you play a role in encouraging interest in projects. It didn't, didn't work well, in this one. When the initial market engagement was carried out, the Stroll, there were five potential bidders that came forward. Um, mm -hmm. The next stage attracted two, um, and then one of those dropped out. Uh, and um, there are a number of reasons for that. The first is the gravitational effect of the booming economies in the southeast of England and in the south of Ireland, or the Republic of Ireland, a big pun. Um, and it's just a fact um, that profit margins in those areas are higher than those that will be um, available uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, combine that with the uncertainty over the funding for the project, which was cited by the bidder that withdrew, um, and um, the long procurement times and um, inevitably higher bid costs that go with um, public sector work. Uh, and those factors created the situation which led to there being only a single bidder left in the, comp in the competition. Okay. Uh, we've already touched on projects delayed through judicial reviews. So I won't ask you to go through all that again, but uh, the, the A5 still hasn't been resolved. And in fact, I think there's another JR about to start if it hasn't already started. Um, do you think, is there any merit in the argument that it's, it's too easy to take a judicial review in this country? If you take one in, in the South, or any equivalent uh, format, it, uh, well, I'm, I'm led to believe, I don't have the figures, but you, you might have, that uh, it, it costs a fortune down there to take a JR, and, and you won't probably get legal aid to do it either. And I'm thinking back to my days in Lisbon. Lisbon Council has 27 judicial reviews against it at the moment. It's just too easy. Is there merit in trying to 
may, you, you might actually need the legal profession to weed them out, but really that, that gets, it gets ridiculous at times. Would it be, would it be helpful if, um, I mean, Des, do you want to just say a little bit about what we've done to, or sure. what we're currently doing? It, is, it doesn't cost very much to take a challenge here, mm. um, and that is, that, that's a big issue. Certainly in terms of a, a, a procurement challenge, you know, against a, 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 a contract award, um, it is uh, relatively easy in Northern Ireland to, to do that. Um, the, the issue, I suppose, arises because of the change in the regulations. Previous regulations, uh, if a bidder felt that they had been unfairly treated, they would go to the courts and ask for the courts to put in place uh, an order to stop the award of the contract. Uh, the most recent change to the regulations means that if you put a, uh, a request in saying that a written in saying that the uh, regulations haven't been followed, there's an automatic stay. And in Northern Ireland, that the cost of that to, to an agreed bidder will be something like £250, mm -hmm. plus whatever he pays the solicitor to write the letter. Uh, and we can show you back at the office uh, a stack of letters which are all exactly the same wording, so there's yeah. not an awful lot of intelligence needed to put that in place. Um, if you compare that we compare that to London, where the, the situation there is that, the, as I understand it, the fee that you pay is related to the extent of damages that you wish to recover should the course, uh, case be taken. And that, to do that, to estimate your damages, you have to, obviously have to understand what your case is and have that presented. Mm. So it is relatively easy in Northern Ireland to, to do that. And if you're in a supplies contract or a services contract and you're a you know, an incumbent in that, and you lose the contract, then quite clearly it's in your interest then, if you're unscrupulous, to stay on the contract because it doesn't cost very much to, to do that. What we've been doing uh, now is that we're much more clear to, to the bidder that we will undertake a review of what we've done in re uh, arriving at the decision and be clear that we feel that the, that decision is sound and that we will proceed to go to full hearing. And if we're successful in that, then we will seek uh, recovery of costs. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Hannum, I was more thinking of planning disputes. Sorry, right. yeah. sorry that's my but fault. Yeah. That, no, it's okay. Um, um, go ahead, sir. There's this talked about the challenges under procurement law, but um, in terms of impact, um, the, the um, most impactful challenges are raised under uh, environmental law. Um, and again, similarly, there is a very low hurdle. Um, in fact, that hurdle has been lowered in all, um, by um, European law, the, the so-called Aarhus Convention, um, which um, enables uh, challenges raised on environmental grounds to be brought at very little cost and risk to the challenger. And if you look at the A5, the A6, Casement Park, uh, Arc 21, Southern Regional College, uh, Craig Avon Campus, North South Interconnected, Rose Energy Park, all of these um, challenges have been raised at cost through um, environmental reasons. Um, now, it's possible, yes, as you suggested, that it, we could address this by um, looking at the, um, the, the way in which judicial reviews are handled. You could, for example, reduce the length of time in which um, an objector has to raise that objection. That currently, it's three months. In other jurisdictions, it's down to one month. Um, but I think it would be more sensible to look at the underlying reasons why people are objecting and see whether there's anything that can be done to address those underlying causes rather than dealing with the symptoms, which are the JRs themselves. Um, and clearly at the moment um, there is a problem uh, in terms of compensation. People who, who um, suffer for the good of the community are currently not being generously compensated. Um, they're paid the bare minimum and unsurprisingly they resent that and that leads to um, um, opposition um, which can be protracted and result in much higher costs than would be the case if we actually paid them reasonable compensation. Um, secondly, we perhaps could, um, as David suggested, do more in advance um, of um, moving to procurement by way of consultation to identify what the objections are yeah. um, at a much earlier stage and to deal with those. Um, the French have a system for what they call a, the Commission for National Debate, um, which is an independent body um, which carries out research into major projects in advance of them being <coughs> taken forward. Um, and gives an opportunity for objectors to raise those objections um, and um, the Commission will force developers and planners to take account of those. Uh, and as a result of that approach, um, most projects consider different options. About half of them are modified and about 10% of them are abandoned. Um, 
before they get to the point where huge sums of money have been spent on them. So if, if a different approach was taken to um, consultation in advance of these major projects, perhaps we would see fewer objectors and thus um, less costly delay. Okay. Well, I better put it in the record, Chair, before the Green Party descends on me that I wasn't trying to stop environmental based <laughs> judicial reviews. <laughs> I mean, the public must be allowed the opportunity, and organisations with an interest must be allowed the opportunity to do these things. I just think that, uh, frankly, some of them are too easily got and vexatious, and that's on the record too. Um, the last question I have for you, again, still for yourself. Um, some of these projects, such as the Critical Care Centre and the University of Ulster, suffer from construction problems, causing serious delays and increased costs. So, is, is this the construction problems in terms of uh, poor workmanship, or bad materials, or a bad specification to start with? What, what, where would you lay the blame for this? Uh, they, it's more likely to be um, poor workmanship and or poor materials. Um, but I think it's important to stress that if it is those causes, um, then the cost falls to the contractor, not to the public. Absolutely. Well, that was my next question. But it's, obvious, but it's yeah. not common by any means. It's not um, something that happens very often. Well, what are the construction problems then that the, that the report refers to? In, uh, in the, the case of the hospital? No, if, if there are construction problems, but the one you've identified is uh, faulty workmanship, which is picked up by the contractor. But the inference here is that construction problems add to the cost of the contract. They can, the, what can happen is there can be a cascade of delay caused by a single problem. Um, that, that original problem may be um, attributable to a contractor and he will um, fix it. But there may be further problems down the line that are a result of that um, initial problem. Um, so a pro and the project will get delayed, and as a result of being delayed, other costs arise. So you have the cost of um, keeping the project team going, um, you have the cost of uh, the opportunity cost of not getting the use of the facility. All of those things will increase overall the cost. Do you think that the, the as my last question, Chair, do, do you think that the penalty clauses in these major contracts are sufficient to deter people from, uh, let's say, un underestimating the cost of the contract and then relying on being able to claw the money back? I think Des is probably the place to. I, I think that, that, uh, that there are difficulties in, in structuring uh, penalty clauses, as we might call them, um, because you can't cover consequential loss typically under contract law. I think the more significant thing is that you make sure that if a contractor has underperformed that you have a process in place that allows them not to tender for a period and to correct that. I think some of the, the, the things that are mentioned in the report indicate a lack of technical ability in the industry, particularly around mechanical and electrical systems. Uh, I think that's a strategic issue for Northern Ireland that we need to, we've lost, as part of the recession, we lost a number of firms that were of high quality and capable of, uh, you know, self-design in those areas. Uh, but I think that's a weakness that we are trying to address and look at because, you know, on a complex building, the, the mechanical and electrical stuff, in my mind, outweighs the architectural and the structural issues that can be there. I think the industry itself, as well, has had issues with workmanship where uh, they, we have moved maybe to self-certification in terms of workmanship, and I think we need to be much clearer about inspections on sites and what project managers need to look at. Okay, fair okay. enough. Thank you okay. all very much. Uh, Mr Boylan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'll, I'll try and think what is all very welcome. Thank you very much for your, your uh, answer so far. I have a question for everybody. So, David, I'll start with you in the middle, um, because as, as the conversation developed, is it, um, or is there anywhere, listen to what Brett has said there on the five-step plan and everything else and some of the comments. Is there an accountability mechanism built in here? And I asked it in the context of if there's a delay in planning, if there's a JR or whatever it is, surely there has to be an accountability because that adds to the cost. So, I mean, how do you recover that or how is that built in in the whole process? Or yeah, have you give consideration to that? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, under existing arrangements, um, 
uh, individual projects will be the responsibility of the accounting officer within the relevant department. Um, so it'll be for the accounting officer in the particular department, obviously, to determine the best way to manage projects in that area. Now, obviously, through the work of the Department of Finance, um, our desire is that there are common approaches, processes um, across all departments. But um, specifically on the point of what should happen if there's a delay because um, somebody has taken a ju judicial review, um, then I think it takes us back to the earlier conversation where if you get to that stage, in a sense, it's almost too late. What we need to do is focus more on making sure that we try to avoid the, the, the position where somebody is able to take a judicial review. In other words, we should be doing much more, as Brett and Des have said, in the earlier commissioning phase of the project. You know, and appreciate an, an early engagement is key to all of it, but, but I still think, because if I asked you to break down the total case of every, every one of those projects, and who's responsible for every pound spent, because I mean, plans, and, and I, I recognise the planning issue, but across government, we need to be looking at that thing collectively together. That's that's the case I'm making. That's the point I want to make. Well, you know. and I suppose the, the short answer is for each individual project, it'll be the accounting officer that is accountable for the performance of that project in each department. Okay. Uh, that's um, of you. Um, we had the construction employers federation in, obviously. Time delays and time lags is an issue. You know, you have the outline business case, qualifying, tender, and award of contract. And that, they mentioned that last week. I mean, what can we do to you know, the process to help that or instill confidence within within the industry itself? Yeah, I think we need to be a, uh, a bit more transparent about our performance. Um, and you know, when we when we go to tender, we meet, we make sure that we have the funding available that we're not asking contractors or consultants to tender on spec uh, on the likelihood that the funding might come later. So I think we need to be absolutely clear if we're going to tender, the project has the, all the necessary approvals that are needed and that when the tender is assessed and awarded, that quite quickly after that the contract can move into delivery phase. And that's one of the things that we looked at as a result of the SIB study is to, to put a real focus on that part of the process that actually delivers the, the construction element of, of the project. And I think that, uh, you know, your, your point around who's responsible, I think we, we've, we've issued guidance that uh, on these projects now there will be a senior responsible owner and they will be charged with making sure that the project is started properly and has all of those approvals. If we had a, a process then that handed the responsibility from that commissioning phase, as I call it, which is there to decide which projects are going ahead, what funding is in place for it. If we handed that over properly, we could then have an SRO that would be responsible for the construction element, and that would be quite clearly then visible to the contractor that, you know, we're organised, we're ready to go, and then we can get on with the contractor and, and construct those things. Thank you. Um, Brett, over to yourself. In terms of the construction industry itself, your views on the level of engagement and how do you think they could improve those engagement? Because Listening to last week, I mean, obviously there's concerns within the level of get, get. There's a lot going on by way of engagement. Um, Des chairs the Construction Industry Forum um, for Northern Ireland, which brings representatives of um, all areas in the industry together um, and um, enables them to talk to government. The procurement board has been opened up more widely and, and has greater representation from outside government. Um, we publish um, at a level of detail that's um, not matched uh, anywhere else on these islands, details of forthcoming procurements uh, to assist the industry. Um, and then <coughs> underpinning all of that, um, there's a great deal of bilateral engagement um, between Des and his colleagues. Um, Sue and her colleagues and, and um, uh, SIB staff um, between uh, the industry, uh, the industry's representatives. Uh, so um, I think there are plenty of opportunities and those opportunities are being used. Okay, I just want to read this now because there's a specific point that that left us. Um, the representatives from the industry have told us the investment strategy and procurement pipeline 
bear little resemblance to reality. I mean, what's your view? Is that a fair enough comment? Or no, I don't think it's a fair comment at all. Um, the, uh, the delivery tracking system, which is, I think, the pipeline, um, uh, contains details of all projects um, with a value, capital projects with a value of greater than half a million pounds and professional services greater than £100,000. Um, and uh, it is freely available. Um, it can be accessed through a website. Um, the detail data can be downloaded into a spreadsheet. Um, reports are passed themselves as MLAs to departments. Um, and uh, this provides, as I said, an unmatched picture of what's happening. In fact, the most recent criticism of the system has been that it doesn't um, cover enough. It should be extended to cover supplies and services as well. Um, so um, our engagement with, through um, Construction uh, Forum, for example, um, uh, has, has not um, supported the view that it's inaccurate in any way. Um, the industry was consulted over the design of the system. Um, there is an opportunity at every meeting of the Construction Industry Forum for any concerns to be raised. Not that they have to wait until then. We're very happy to engage um, on any aspect of the system and to make any sensible changes that would be proposed. But um, that, that those um, requests have not come forward over the last five years. Okay. I'm just, is there comments? Is that, um, and so over to yourself, the same, generally the same question, but in terms of at times they don't be listened to the feed. So, I mean, we're hearing that from them just to give you a chance to respond in terms of listening to the industry yeah. and making that relationship better. Yeah. So, really keen uh, to have a good working relationship with the industry. And actually, um, Des and I actually spend quite a bit of our time going out and meeting, uh, you know, meeting the industry individually and in their groups. Um, I think, you know, we can always do, try to do more um, but we do have a very good relationship. We've encouraged people that when they've got issues to pick up the phone to me or to Dares to email us, and they do. <laughs> um, we, we get quite a few of them emailing and calling us. Um, but, you know, I, I think we all want to have good engagement. I think we will deliver better, better services, better projects for a result of having good engagement. And so I'm really up for that. Um, and if it's, you know, I feel we've spent quite a lot of our time in the past year doing this. Clearly, we've got more to do. And, uh, you know, that is definitely somewhere we want to be. OK. And just finally, Chair, because it, it'll be a bugbear, but don't ask it just for clarification, because this issue does. I think you've, I've heard you correctly, you've answered it, but just for clarification, see the accountability issue needs to be more robust and responsibility. And I know it's across departments, and it may be a planning issue, but I mean it's about value for money and on public spend. So we are saying, when into the future, there's a better, more accountable, robust responsibility built in mm. in the new process or this process. Then. Okay, thank you, Mr. McHugh. Uh, the party and all, like you, is all very welcome here today. Um, just to kind of go back again uh, in your presentation, uh, you alluded to uh, the budgets not or to projects not being delivered on budget and on time, and uh, the need for independent expertise. Uh, does that expertise uh, does that exist to say um, here in the island of Ireland, or uh, where is it that we look for that expertise uh, in order to? Sort of, um, uh, reinforce uh, the whole process, and um, out of that, you know, are there lessons there that we can adopt or learn from that? Well, this is this is an area where, like I said, a lot has happened over the last number of years, and we have worked very hard to improve the professionalism of our procurement and uh, construction uh, staff. Um, and I'll hand over to Des just in a second, but I think. Des, you've got about 169 people now who have a procurement or specific construction. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. We, we've, we've invested quite heavily in, in staff uh, development. Um, our organisation is about 340-odd folk at the moment, and we've about 170 of those will have either a construction professional qualification, either a registered architect, chartered engineer, and then we have uh, others who are professional chartered uh, procurement people, uh, the highest grade that there is now in, in that area. 
Um, we've also 100 staff that have been put through contract management, uh, accredited contract management training as well, so that we can apply the contract terms fairly with contractors. Um, but I, I think as well as that, we have access to, we're, we're linked into other skills and other experiences through the Cabinet Office. We're, we're linked in, I'm linked in with the uh, commercial function in the Cabinet Office, and there's been quite a focus there uh, in recent years in building up skills and expertise in commercialism. Uh, we've just undertaken a, 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 a trial recently that put uh, 12 of our people through an assessment centre uh, over a one-day thing, uh, and, and they were came back rated uh, pretty pretty good. Uh, some of them passed ratings that you can get under that assessment. And the issue now is how do we roll that type of development out around the system? But in terms of bringing expertise in, you know, we would make an assessment as to whether we have expertise in CPD that can actually do it. But if we don't, we will bring it in. We will buy it in from the market, or we will go to the cabinet office, uh, for example, for assistance. <coughs> so I think we, we, we need to recognise when you need it, when you need expertise, uh, you need to be able to, to stand up and ask for it. Has that been the case to date? That's where you've had to bring expertise in. Yeah, well, we, 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 was, we, we have been using uh, consulting engineers or uh, design consultants uh, quite frequently, and within those tenders, we will allow for specialist uh, expertise to come in on environmental um, matters or planning matters or whatever to support the particular project. And yet, no, we still felt to in the presentation that it, uh, the whole process wasn't independent enough. Well, I can't comment on the... I'll comment on those on those projects that are in there, but I do think going forward, the, as I mentioned, the the business case being split and, and having a, a commercial view as part of the business case approval process will, if they come to CBD, there'll be an element of independence there, although we're in government. But if we were looking at a case, we would be bringing in others to to, to support that type of scrutiny. Uh, just another criticism that we would have heard as well too that. Um, uh, that departments operate silos um, and that there wasn't joined up thinking. Uh, and um, has there been any sort of progress in relation to that and helping to break down those barriers? I think referring to the point I made earlier, since departmental restructuring and with CPD um, taking responsibility for health estates, you're seeing that um, your skills uh, are concentrated in a smaller number of departments now. Uh, you're seeing through the work that CPD does, uh, through the procurement board, that there's an awful lot more in terms of trying to make sure that people are following the same guidance. There's still, as Des described earlier, there's still work to be done in that regard, but progress definitely has been made. Uh, and I think in that regard, uh, I said at the start, you know, we, we uh, welcome the recommendation in the report that there be a review of governance just to see if there are better ways of structuring ourselves than we have at the moment. We think that's a good thing, a timely, and we're very happy to do that. And similar to just the comments of Mr Boyle, uh, that in the delivery of many of these large projects, you know, there's a lot of people involved. Uh, and to what extent is progress actually monitored at the heart of government of these large projects? And uh, is any action being taken as a result of monitoring? Well, again, the, uh, under the current arrangements, um, responsibility for project delivery rests with the accounting officer in the relevant department. Um, and if we look at how we are structured compared with some other jurisdictions, then I think the uh, obvious difference is that we don't have a single oversight body here, uh, and we don't have an independent advisory body either. Um, and these are things that in the, the governance view that's been recommended that I think it is definitely well worth looking at. So we're, we're very open to seeing whether that would be appropriate here. Thank you. Just on that point, Mr. Sterling, um, a number of occasions you've made reference to the, the accounting officer in the various departments or whatever. Ultimately, then, who's the accounting officer for the whole system in terms of the public purse in Northern Ireland? Um, sorry, which system do you mean? The, the well, 
Uh, so you, you're head of the civil service. If you've got heads of the various departments and they're the accounting officers in those departments, if there are, if there are issues within the departments or across government, who's ultimately accountable for that? Well, I suppose the, the constitutional position is that um, the permanent secretary in each department is under the direction and control of that particular minister. Um, people sometimes think that as head of the civil service, I can tell the other permanent secretaries what to do. Um, sadly, that's not the case. Um, uh, they're very much responsible to their own ministers. However, um, when, the, when there's no minister, uh, when there's no ministers, again, people thought that I had some um, omnipotent, omnipotence, but uh, sadly, that was also not true. Um, uh, not one to be facetious. I think the important point here is that there's a significant role for the Department of Finance in terms of seeking to provide guidance which all departments adhere to. Um, whilst I do not have powers of direction and control over other um, departments, we do have a, an NICS board um, which seeks to manage which you the chair? civil service, which I chair. Um, and certainly, you know, we're very keen through the board to work collaboratively together, to work collectively. Uh, and to um, have common standards as far as possible. So uh, at the moment, I think one of the issues that we need to look at is we have a procurement board which is responsible for uh, producing and uh, disseminating guidance across departments. Yeah. Uh, I think probably fair to say our view would be it's probably time to have a look at that and see clear. whether yep. there isn't overlap with okay. what we're trying to do with the NICS yep. board. Uh, and you chair the procurement board as well, do you? Um, in the absence <coughs> of ministers, its uh, procurement board was set up on the basis that it would be chaired by the finance, uh, minister. finance minister. Okay. It's just that uh, last week, I don't know whether you uh, had the opportunity to have a look or listen or whatever. I'm sure you have many other things to do. But I did put the question to the uh, Construction Employers Federation when they were in front of us last week around the procurement board, uh, would they have a desire to take up a place on that board so that the private sector was feeding into the process? They would be very keen, I think everyone would agree, in terms of the response that we had around this table. They'd be very keen to take that up. When you're looking at, as you've just indicated you are, can I suggest that you do just that yep. and perhaps look at them or indeed others in the private sector who might <laughs> be able to bring a different emphasis to, to the procurement board other than those solely from the private sector. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and in fact, you know, now we have a minister, so the minister will be chairing the procurement board, and we have started a discussion about you know, representation on the board, how often it meets, so it's very timely. Very okay. happy to take that away. Thank you. Ms Flynn? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and maybe just to follow on um, from some of the things that David had touched on, I'll direct this to Sue, if that's OK, and if others want to come in. Um, but you had mentioned earlier, so obviously around the, the, the new five-step model that's coming into place, yeah. Brett um, had also referred to um, an independent assessor that would help assess risk. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, maybe from some of your experience in Whitehall, are there any other sort of structural changes that we can maybe um, bring into place here based on some of those practices, yeah. not even just necessarily in Whitehall, but in other parts of the world, something that's yeah. tried, tested, that's been seen to work, that we can maybe use or try and implement or work towards that um, here? So I think, um, first of all, I think as Des has alluded to as well, we do do quite a lot of work with uh, with Cabinet Office. They have got their, um, you know, their infrastructure uh, project authority and also their commercial crown commercial service and we do a lot of work with them I think the infrastructure um, project authority is very interesting in how they how they have evolved actually since 2010 in 2010 they were known as the major projects authority and they try to have more of a mandate mandatory role with departments um, I don't think that you know that was a successful. Probably um, they've, they've evolved and now they're in a very much a supporting role. But they publish. They 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 work on a very transparent basis. So there are SROs, as Des has mentioned, for every for all the projects. Um, you know those SROs are named. Their letters of appointment are published. 
Um, and I think that comes back to the accountability points that you were talking about earlier, you know, that they are being held to account for the, for the project. Um, there is a, um, the Infrastructure Projects Authority publishes on an annual basis a sort of RAG rating of all the projects, and they show how those RAG ratings are changing um, over the annual process. They're not afraid, and nor should they be, to have red and amber projects. I mean, that, in a way, is a very honest assessment. Green projects are very few and far between. Um, but I think that is something that, you know, we are looking at. They also do a very, a very supporting role for departments. So they are, and they're giving challenge. They're not afraid to go in. Departments welcome them. Um, and I think that we have got some lessons to, you know, we, we're looking at that to see what we can learn. And then in the Crown Commercial Service, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, things that they are doing where they've had a lot of resource, they've pushed a lot of resource into this, and I think we can take the best of what they're doing, um, tailor it for our, for our use here, which is, which is what we are doing. Um, they have something called a playbook. A playbook doesn't really quite sound the right title for what they do, but um, it's uh, a real package of all their their resourcing skills, how they are upskilling their, their people. And we are feeling, you know, we're, we're very fortunate. They're very keen to support us. And we are taking everything that we can get to, to help develop our people. Yeah, I think one, one of the things in terms of uh, skills development is they, they have a project delivery profession that uh, covers quite a, you know, one thing about government, it, it gets itself involved in very strange projects and unique projects. In my experience, it's, it's more difficult to do projects uh, for government than it is for private uh, organisations. And they have, we did a bit of work just to look at the, not only on construction projects, but the types of projects that are being carried forward by government. And we found in a survey something like £12 billion of projects right across the system and various departments ready to go. And I think we need people who are project managers interested in, in going from one project to the other to do projects, and we have a, pro a proposal through, uh, approved through the NICS board uh, to set that type of uh, thing up, uh, so that if government comes up with a project, not necessarily in construction, but wants to do something that we have people who have who've developed themselves and want to be professional project managers. Uh, and, and that's some work that we've we've got on the go as well. And we also put people through the Major Projects Leadership Academy, which is run by um, Cabinet Office. We have had some people go through that. I think there is more we can do there. I think we can have more people going through that academy. Um, you know, it's it's a really you know to get to the end. They don't pass everybody, and uh, you know to get to the end and to successfully complete it is a very good thing to do. So we are. You know, we are not. You know, we are keen to take the best and uh, take it here and look and see what you know if we need to adapt it slightly. Um, but we are definitely in the space of looking at what others are doing. Thank you, and it's useful just to hear about. You have mentioned the academy there, and I know yeah. days you were speaking earlier on about some of that work's already started around upskilling people yeah. and you know the process of, of training, um, and maybe even just. Uh, towards the panel, if, if um, your opinion on the, the quality of our project man management as, as it stands, and I know those steps are being taken to train up skill people and do the further, um, the further training, um, and maybe just if you think that there's too many generalists that are in charge of large projects at the minute, and if that's part of the problem that we're, we're facing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things I admire about civil servants, uh, not being a, a lifer. Well, one. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, not, not being a lifer. What I, surprised me is that civil servants can move from one area to another area and pick up things very quickly. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'm a civil engineer by training. It took me a long time to get to that point. But I, I do think that, that we're in a much more complex space now and with less resource. And if we lose resource, you know, if we lose cash or whatever, you know, we're losing the opportunity to do other things with that. So I think <coughs> professionalism in that case is much yes. more important, I think. Uh, and certainly we want to try and, and push that now. Um, but you shouldn't uh, be shy. You know, like, uh, we're probably ahead of the game compared with other jurisdictions in the development of a project delivery profession. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we had uh, our friends from, from South of Ireland up uh, yesterday. That their national development programme is mm -hmm. now starting to scare them because they realise they haven't got the capability probably to jump from 
very low levels of capital expenditure in the crash, up to something that is, and I think last year they, they did about eight billion pounds of expenditure there. So skills and having the right skills and the right people in place, I think it's absolutely critical that, that we have that review. Uh, we will always need civil services, policy makers, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But I think I would really encourage people to see uh, life in the civil service as a project manager because some of the work that goes on is, is fantastic. As an, well, there you go, project manager, me making a case for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Just to develop this a little bit further, in terms of those actually leading the projects, um, you've, you've indicated there's been some degree of development and training. Do you have a central list of the numbers of people who you consider to be well trained and expert to lead <coughs> large projects? Well, I think we'll start the, the process of, of identifying uh, the senior responsible owner uh, and giving them a formal letter of appointment. Uh, will start to, to bring us into that sort of space where we can we can look at uh, developing registers of that because as well as giving someone the, the role to do, we also have to support them and assess them and make sure that they're competent in that area so that we don't throw them in the, in, in the pool and ask them to swim without the lesson. So I think that's one area. We have a number of uh, people who have gone through these, these, these courses and, and I think we'll put further people through those as well. Is the course uh, assessed? Yeah, they, yeah. I mean, training without assessment, so much really just we would, we like accreditation. And uh, so how many, uh, and what's the precise number of people at present who have actually you deemed to have been through this specialist qualification training, uh, or many, and how many are currently underway? Well, I, I only have those numbers for from my own organisation, but I assume we could, we could ask around the system for that. If that's well, you know, Mr. Sterling, you know, who, who coordinates centrally am, amongst other departments? Yeah, we, we can get that. I, yeah. I, I thought you had 60 or so in the, oh, the, C, the, the stuff. developing yeah. a pro, a project delivery profession. Yeah, well, in terms of interest in that, we have, I mean, we did a survey on that, that, that we've got 1,500-odd folk who would like to be in that space. Um, we're looking now at the at anyone who's going to develop uh, or be involved in spending uh, a spending project of more than 20 million will be required to go through an assessment. So we will we could build that. that currently, I don't think certainly in CPD we don't have that. And the question is, how many presently have it? So yeah, how many have, want to be there? Uh, how many presently have it across the civil service? And how many are under uh, training at present? Well, I, I don't have those numbers. We'll, we'll get you okay. a list that covers not just CPD, but covers fine. all departments and, and associated arm's length bodies. There's also this trouble of uh, um, staff turnover in large projects, and, and not even just in construction. It seems to be, there seems to be a pattern within the civil service of staff turning over. Um, how do you actually ever assess whether someone's good, what they're doing? To keep changing what they're doing, and potentially nobody becomes accountable for a particular project. Who's going to pick up that one, Mr. Sterling? <laughs> Are you just talking about generally then? Well, let's talk about generally. We do have um, a, an annual appraisal process, which would be fairly mm -hmm. standard. Um, yeah. Like all appraisal processes, I think people always um, conclude that we could do do it better. Um, I, I think. Appraisal processes are really only as good as the people who are doing the appraising. Um, so I think this is something that we're constantly looking at and looking to improve. But uh, certainly as far as um, uh, construction and procurement professionals are concerned, you know, DES has outlined a lot of the work that we're doing to professionalise that, to increase commercial skills. Uh, I think we've put six people through the a major project leadership academy. I think we've put 12 people through the program, leadership program. Uh, we can give you details on all those that have gone through the various other leadership development programs that have a, a, yeah, a focus on procurement and construction as well. So, um, as Des has said, those programs are accredited. So, you know, when you've completed them, you have to complete some form of assessment or exam. And then, uh, Professionals within the civil service will be subject to the annual appraisal process in the same way that everybody else is. Okay. Firstly, to you, Mr. Armstrong, would you accept that um, 
the appraisal would be a lot less subjective if it was at the end of a uh, sizable contract and you could actually see what happened during that contract and the, the person who's been in charge of it during that time and how it has went. Would that be uh, an easier way to appraise rather than perhaps subjective? How has it gone? You know, I think that's, that's the, the role of this project review. I think that uh, you know, if, we have, if we establish this project delivery uh, profession, then those individuals who will be involved in projects will, by virtue of joining the profession, know that they have to be accountable as professionals. They, you know, they will be in areas of responsibility and that you know you should expect your performance to be recorded and assessed, and I think that's you know I think that's a way of developing the civil those parts of the civil service that are involved in projects. Certainly, uh, you know professionalism I think comes with uh, you have to assess how people perform against the standard. The commercial function has done quite a bit of work, and again in Whitehall, and we're tapping in. You know we'll take good ideas from anywhere. They have a standard there that assesses. Uh, individuals. Uh, in, the, in the procurement field, we developed our own set of standards. So, you know, we might have a novice, an individual coming in to start to learn the profession, you know, a more experienced expert. So we already have these sort of matrices that you can actually uh, sort of assess individuals against in terms of their development through the, through the, the process. And then, Mr. Sterling, would you accept that it would be much more objective to appraise someone based on, on their activity through perhaps an entirety of a project or at least for a very sizable part of a project rather than continually changing staff and perhaps losing information uh, and key information <coughs> to be passed on by, by continually rotating staff? No, indeed. Um, and in actual fact, um, if, your, if your job is to be a project or a programme manager, in some senses, it is easy to determine your performance because uh, there will be very obvious metrics against which you can be judged. You know, have you delivered something on budget? Have you delivered it on time? Um, so inevitably, those things will be part of the appraisal process, and um, I think uh, I think that's only right and proper. Um, so th you know, that that will be part of the way in which people are appraised, whose job is to be a project manager. We're actually, um, just in, in the Department of Finance, we're actually sort of piloting um, uh, a new, um, I suppose, you know, a, a new toolkit where we are able to see a contract, you know, whatever it's let for, let's say, whatever the contract is awarded for, um, how it is progressing at a glance so that, you know, you get warning signs if the cost is going too high. But you can also then, we hope also to be able to get into the business case and actually be able to monitor all of this throughout the life, throughout, you know, so that actually we could see more information about how people are doing during the duration of a contract. Um, and that work is underway at the moment. That's right. Just, um, yeah. In fact, the Department, Department of Finance has just issued new guidance, we have. which covers indeed the appointment of SROs and uh, no designed to make that more uh, transparent yeah. to increase accountability. Um, and again, I think that would be quite a strong and robust improvement yeah. to the current. Well, I think if you are if you are being transparent about somebody you know who is going to take on an SRO role, not only will we make you, know, you need to make sure the individual <coughs> can perform that role, but they will also know what they are also committing to. Um, so I think that that will also help. And I'm just thinking in terms of the private sector, it would be very rare to have a lead engineer halfway through a project to, to swap over and you take them somewhere else, unless you have a very good reason, perhaps a bigger project, that, that their skills were needed. Um, so generally, the engineers in charge of projects run it the full way through because they know all the information and they can be held accountable. Do you not think we should be doing something similar in the civil service? I, I personally, I mean, I think the SROs, you know, if you're appointing somebody as an SRO, you really are expecting them to stay for the duration of the project. I'm not sure we... Uh, Certainly, I know in Whitehall yep. there, is, there historically was a problem with high turnover of Very. SROs. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'm, sure genuinely, I don't know we have the same problem no. here. Um, I haven't any evidence to hand no. to show that, but um, no. okay. I don't know. did you want to? Uh, um, certainly, in the past, there was quite a high turnover of SROs as they moved um, for career reasons. Um, 
but one of the things... Um, is there SROs, the full terminology? Senior responsible, senior responsible, responsible officer. officer. Mm -hmm. For career um, reasons, so that, oh, yeah. that they've been promoted then. Being promoted. But, but again, the, the civil service can determine whether to do that mid-project, yeah. mid size of the project or not. Yeah. In, in actually, in, in, interestingly, in Whitehall, they actually have the facility to pay a recruitment and retention allowance. So that if, you know, because it, it's quite tough to say to somebody, you know, well, you've taken this project for three or four years. Actually, it's now going to take, you know, whatever, a bit longer. And by the way, you can't get promoted, even though, you know, that would be quite a tough thing to say to it's somebody. Not good for morale. No. <laughs> but in Whitehall, they actually pay a recruitment and retention. You know, I, I don't think it's called uh, recruitment and retention lands, but it's the same thing. And they pay a significant, well, I can pay up to a significant amount of money to keep somebody on a project uh, if, they, if, that is, if that is needed, if they are going to... Uh, you know, forego promotion. They will also, um, you know, perhaps put somebody's promotion on hold for a while. So I think there are things that, you know, they've had to do because their turnover has been far greater than from what I see here, far greater than here. And you know, that's what's happening there. Is that going to be introduced here? Uh, some of the projects that we manage, um, or all of the ones that, that we manage, will have um, a project manager who will stay with that project for its entire duration. Um, many of these major this is projects, SIB. Many of these major projects have a very long life, um, and um, it's obviously desirable that um, the, the, the project managers, as with the SROs, should stay with the project for the whole period. Otherwise, you, you have all sorts of risks arising. So. Um, in the interim period, while these new arrangements are, are coming forward, um, those projects that SIB is involved with, one of the um, uh, things that we insist upon is that we keep the same project manager with the project right the way through its life cycle. How, and just out of interest, Brett, how, do you, how, does, how does that happen? Just if somebody... Because we, re we recruit on that basis. Right. Um, and... Um, I'm, I'm a, a given an example, the mm -hmm. um, Belfast Rapid Transit um, is a, a, was a project where um, there was no local experience of bringing something similar in. So the SIB was asked to go out and find someone who could not just have, bring the experience um, of um, mass transit projects, um, but was also prepared to stay with that project for its duration, um, from its inception right through to its delivery. Um, but in the course of doing that, was able to um, work with the relevant department um, on knowledge transfer um, uh, to the extent that um, the next stage of the project will be taken forward um, by the department itself without that same need for external support. Okay. So, so this idea of, of, of allowing them to, to gain promotion but stay with the yeah. project, yeah. Uh, is that being considered in Northern Ireland? We, well, I think as part of our the work we're doing around the senior responsible owners, the transparency, um, you know, I think we will be looking at what others are doing, yeah. um, uh, you know. I think one thing we need yeah. to do on the basis of this discussion is just check whether we have. we're losing SROs mid-project. Anecdotally, I, I'm not aware of um, this being a major problem here, but we can look at that because it's largely, yes. project managers now are largely looking at it either in the Department of Finance or the, the three cooks within the Department for Infrastructure. So we, we can look at that. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it does seem to be an issue that you can lose essential information, key skills, key knowledge, and certainly in terms of RHI, that was one of the issues that yeah. key staff were moved yeah. through the project. Not, not a, a capital project, but that was a, that was a yeah. message that I certainly picked up uh, uh, in following that, that if you move your key staff, you, you, you risk losing key knowledge and that uh, key information not being passed on. So that seems to be a message that you might need to consider for a wider aspect. Then turning to um, uh, SIB then, uh, Mr Hannan, um, you have uh, access to a whole reservoir of experts that you can assist in larger projects. you think that the public sector is currently making the best use of these experts? And uh, if you were to start with a blank sheet of paper, I mean, we have a very complicated process, multi-layered, uh, uh, to finalise a large project. How would you make the best use of these experts? Uh, uh, with a, if you were to design a blank bit of paper, how would you design the process and make the best use of these experts? Um, 
The way in which SIB works um, is that departments will identify um, where uh, they have a particular need for specific technical expertise, um, which cannot be found um, and really shouldn't be expected to be found within the public sector. Uh, and I gave the example of the Belfast Rapid Transit as being one of those, um, and there are others um, where we've been asked to help. Um, I think it would be wrong to um, simply assume that uh, it, it, it's a good idea to, to, to bring in people from the private sector in every instance, because it isn't. As Des and Sue have explained, an enormous amount of work has gone on to professionalise the project management profession. Uh, it now constitutes a relatively small part of our work um, because of the uh, beneficial impact of the initiatives that um, has, have been described. Um, so uh, I don't think that the, the system is, is, is failing. Um, I think we have good arrangements in place for identifying those circumstances where specific uh, specialist assistance is required. Um, we have never um, uh, turn down requests for help of that kind, nor would I hope will we ever do so. Um, uh, but I would um, hope that over time um, the need for such requests would fall away. Um, in terms of the overall design of, of uh, putting large projects together, is there a better way of integrating the skills in, in SIB to the, the uh, procurement and to the department and, and the whole process? Would you think uh, the whole process needs refined? Sorry, I, the, 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 the SIB plays a part along with the uh, CPD, along with the Department of Finance. Do you think, is, uh, is there a better way of it all matching together? Uh, uh, or are we too fragmented at, at present? What are your views? Well, um, clearly back in um, 2013 when we wrote the report, we put forward the proposition um, that there would be advantages for a different approach, a more centralised approach. Um, and I described earlier in this session what those advantages were, uh, and David explained why it wasn't possible to do that. So um, s setting that aside, I think that the um, attention that is being paid currently to project management, to developing project management skills, professionalising um, the, um, the, the approach taken by the civil service um, uh, is entirely the right one. Um, and as I say, over time, one of the measures of the success of that, those initiatives will be um, a reduction in the reliance um, on uh, external uh, support uh, of the kind that SIB provides. Okay. I mean, I, I actually just support Brett on this. I think that, you know, first of all, we have a strong working relationship. Um, we talk to each other quite a lot and obviously we'll discuss projects and what <coughs> skills we might need. But it is our aim in the Northern Ireland Civil Service to grow, uh, to grow our own people and grow our own talent so that we actually can, um, you know, deliver mu much of this work ourselves. But I think there'll always be a case uh, for the Strategic Investment Board um, and uh, some of its experts, you know, that we that we will always need. But I think that uh, we're very keen. We su we support each other. Okay. Um, turn to another issue about the pipeline and actually yourself, um, Sue. The Construction uh, Employers Federation has expressed concern about the, the validity of the procurement pipeline. Just how, how accurate is the figures that are in it? Um, could this be aggregated for all budget holders in the public sector, not just for some, um, so that there would be a, a better, more, a more accurate figure produced? So I think, um, as Brett probably alluded to uh, at, you know, a bit earlier, we've, we've sort of started a discussion about whether we should add more, um, more, more, more supply, supplies and services to that pipeline information. People clearly do rely on that information and look look for it. Um, and you know, in exactly my own department, you know, we would you know have quite a lot of supplies and services that we you know I think uh, could could use that for. We also, of course, now have e-tenders, 
which also the tenders uh, system, which also um, gives you know notice of what is going to be coming out. So I think that's a bit of work in progress, really, looking at those two two systems to see how we can whether you know how we can keep going forward, really. I, I suspect what they're they're uh, about is just knowing the, the full scale yeah, absolutely. of construction that's um, the pressure's on, and uh, so that you have and they have absolutely. the full picture. And that, in turn, yeah. could influence the timing of other projects because if too yeah. much comes to the table at the one Once, time, and they may not be able to, yeah, coast. absolutely, and that is definitely where we want to be. And I think that transparency is what we're aiming for. One of the problems has been the single-year budget. Um, because the construction industry really need at least six months' notice yeah. of projects coming down the line. Um, but if a budget isn't agreed until several months into the actual year to which it pertains, it makes it virtually impossible for departments to well, give just on that, that point, of notice. The, the CEF, when they were here last week, I think made the point about multi-year yeah. budgets. Mm. What is the civil services view on that? So yes, what, please. Yeah. And actually, no, it, um, it, it, this is something that uh, we've been <laughs> we've been lobbying for for yeah. um, you know. I guess I said earlier, the last multi-year budget yeah. that was agreed by the executive was in 2011. Yeah. Um, we've had a series of single-year so, budgets. And um, so you, David and, and Sue, will be making those recommendations or have to. Uh, the, absolutely, we have knocked on that door of the treasury. The new and, decade new approach yeah. document uh, includes a commitment to developing multi-year programme for government and budget going forward. Now, one of the difficulties for the executive has been that the Treasury has not set long-term spending plans, but there will be a spending review this summer, which will presumably set spending totals for several years. Uh, the more, the better. And that would allow the executive to produce a programme for government, an investment strategy and an underpinning budget for a longer period than we've seen for a while, and that can only be a good thing. And in fact, just on that, when we, we've been to the, you know, since uh, our finance minister has been appointed, we've now been to the Treasury twice, and actually he has raised this issue with them uh, on both occasions. Um, uh, the two, two different chief secretaries now, um, but he has raised the matter and uh, you know has received you know very warm uh, warm responses around it. So I think we're quite hopeful that uh, you know we will see multi-year budgets, not the one that will come out. Is cheaper takes money to buy whiskey. We'll oh, see. <laughs> just the final, just the final question on, on the pipeline. Um, <laughs> In the, in the uh, audit office report um, on page <laughs> 9, we were given the information there was 10.6 billion during an eight-year period, and yet in the, the next two years, uh, which, which actually that average is about 1.3 billion per year, and the next two years we're expecting to spend 4.2 billion. Um, you know, is that has there been a huge lift in capital expenditure? Is the capacity to deliver this? What's what's happening? Can I ask? So I don't know what figure. Brief, because we do need to make progress, and other members coming in. So, and if one person can answer the question, if you. Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't actually know uh, what Sue has figure. All the money. <laughs> if only. Um, can I come back to you on that yeah. on okay. that point? Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Hildage. Thanks, Chair, and you're very welcome, folks. A long this afternoon. Uh, I, I want to turn to the uh, issue of previous reports and previous recommendations that, that were flying about, maybe. Five, six, seven years ago. And firstly, Mr. Han, uh, there was a, an SIB report, prepared report uh, for, for the procurement board in 2013, and it, it would appear to be a fairly direct and strongly strongly worded report. But there was dissatisfaction uh, with the SIB uh, around that time, um, particularly at paragraph two and eleven, which the audit report says. Basically, the SIB identified the need to, and I quote, remove an inefficient, wasteful, and bureaucratic processes. Uh, could you provide us maybe with some more detail on what the report was actually referring to at that stage? Well, it's many of the things that um, we've referred to today as having been addressed. Um, the um, problems in those days um, were around sclerotic processes that were holding up the approval, for example, of business cases. Um, over long um, assessments internally within departments, uh, the planning issues, um, some of which still pertain, others of which don't. Um, so it was not one single cause um, 
but um, the, the report, um, which made, I think, 72 recommendations, uh, many of them very detailed, um, sought to address. Um, and uh, as we've heard this afternoon, a lot of work has, has gone into doing that. Um, so one of the recommendations, for example, is to do with the continuity of SROs, another to do with the continuity of um, uh, project managers, to do with the professionalization of, of, um, of the project management profession. Um, so it would be difficult to say that the same factors which pertained back in 2013 uh, in their entirety still pertain today, because that wouldn't be true. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very but are there any wasteful processes that you would identify today that should be dealt with? There are always um, improvements that could be made. Um, and the big one that we've been talking about um, from, from, from the outset has been the new business case process. Um, will provide this external view to match the one being um, presented by the project's promoters. Uh, and I think that represents a real step change in the assessment of business cases and should lead to far more accurate um, cost estimates, which is what we're trying to get. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Sterling, then on the, the report at section 2.9 onwards, sets out a very detailed uh, weaknesses identified by the SIB. Uh, with the recommendations, of course, to improve the situation. Uh, would you agree with the recommendations made by the SIB in that report of 2013? Um, well, certainly at the time, uh, the Procurement Board obviously oversaw the, the handling of that report. And I think, as I uh, highlighted earlier, there wasn't ministerial agreement at the time to <clears throat> the key recommendation about the need for greater centralisation. But what we've tried to do, and we've set out this afternoon, is um, uh, progress things as far as possible. And without rehearsing you know, everything that we've said before, there has been uh, quite significant progress. Um, the incorporation of health estates into construction and procurement division, the improvements to business cases, the introduction of the delivery tracking system, the improved program and project management processes, the development of the project delivery profession, increasing professionalisation of procurement and contract staff, the way in which we're now changing the appointment of uh, senior responsible officers, um, the improved gateway guidance, um, all of these things. That one I didn't mention before was just to deal with some of the issues in and around the planning system was we, um, uh, the Department for Infrastructure has recently set up a cross-government planning forum at which all departments that um, have a responsibility for statutory consultees, um, that forum is meeting, uh, will, will be meeting regularly just to ensure that the way in which statutory consultees play their part in the planning system is better coordinated and managed, which again should help to address some of those things. So, um, whilst the, the big centralisation recommendation wasn't put in place, um, there has been a lot of change, and uh, uh, again, I'm repeating myself, but we welcome the recommendation in the Audit Office report that we can look again to see is there a better business model for this whole thing, and I think it's timely that, that we look at that. Mm -hmm. and of course, you, you chaired the Procurement Board since, what, 2017. Uh, your assessment of that period of time, have you, have, do you feel you've done enough to bring those recommendations through, or is there much more work to be done? Well, again, I think we, we have, you know, the, the, all the points I made there are things that have been done in recent years. Obviously, in the absence of ministers, we were not in a position to introduce any uh, significant strange changes to strategy or policy. So it's great that we've got ministers back now and we'll be able to look and refresh some of these things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Mr. Shirley, just yourself again in relation to uh, your, you sit on the procurement board and also the civil service board. Uh, as far as formal monitoring reports for flagship projects go, could you tell us just a wee bit about that monitoring? Yeah, I think we acknowledged earlier that we don't have a central oversight process um, for looking at major projects. I think that's something that should be looked at now. Um, would such a thing have stopped the cost and uh, time overruns in the project featured in this report? I think that's a moot point, but nonetheless, other jurisdictions have such um, arrangements in place. 
and they seem to think they work well. So I think that's definitely something that we should be looking at. To take on board, yeah. And the, then the individual accounting officers, how, how are they uh, brought before before they look at progress on the on the projects? Are they play a major part in it? Well, at, at, at the moment, the uh, you know individual accounting officers are responsible for the projects within their area. And one of the things we agreed as part of a development process that all permanent secretaries and myself went through last year was that we actually all need to devote more energy just to overseeing projects within our departments. And we agreed that individually we would spend more time doing this. Um, and given that you know each of us has got a different level and number of projects, that's being done in different ways. So, for example, the Department for Infrastructure, they have a, I've forgotten what it's called now, but there, there's a committee which oversees all the projects in the three copes. It's covering, uh, obviously, the department, Northern Ireland Water and Translink. Um, in my department, we have a small number of projects. We don't have any major projects, but I meet um, the accounting officer in the department once a month and we review all the projects in the department and my understanding is that individual um, uh, permit secretaries do similar things in their they, departments. They do that, yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, Mr Armstrong, um, paragraph 2.22 of the report, the NIAO report says that OECD identified specifically an aversion to risk was one of the key factors slowing process innovation in it. Procurement, uh, would you agree with this general aversion to risk uh, still hampering innovation? Well, I, again, I think that's that's down to you know improving the the project delivery profession because then you're you're better able to understand risk and how you might manage that or remove it. Um, I think well, the risk, the aversion to risk, comes from the the problem we have sometimes in putting procurements out to the market that you know any innovation maybe decreases the risks of legal challenge and that sort of stemmies innovation. So I think but I think in terms of risk aversion then we, we do need to pick, put the right people in place, understand what risks there are in the project and then produce proper risk assessments and risk control measures in place and make sure that those are followed through. Okay, thank you. Uh, just as a sort of subsidiary a couple of other points that were raised earlier there obviously there's a and contracts are being drawn up, and there's a, there's a culture there of that it's, it's all about penalty clauses and various things. Is there anything in, in, in Northern Ireland in relation to contracts where there's incentivisation for contractors? Uh, just a, a, a opportunity this morning to talk to a contractor who was home, who's doing more some work on European projects, and and they work in a system whereby they can be incentivised mm -hmm. to deliver on time and within budget. And potentially there's a percentage payment to the contractor for doing so. Is there anything you got in Yeah, I mean, the, we, we, did, we have looked at the, that, that model of early contractor involvement and then producing a, an incentive where if the contractor can work with uh, sort of engineering solutions that produce the price, they get some of that back. I think that, that, that process is, is well established. I think Water may have used it in the past, I think that's it's a feature of the water industry that you bring in contractors and you incentivize them then to um, earn more money by thought process than by mm -hmm. by sweat. I think that's that's a good thing. Um, Should it be used more then, or well, we we, we believe in movements. In, in some projects, you should be doing this type of thing. The, the prison project that we went on to includes open book arrangements, so you're, you're sharing the risk with the contractor as to how the project might be delivered, particularly when you want something that's, you know, has to be done at a particular time. Um, you know, driving just prices on, driving tenders just the lowest price all the time, I think, over a period of time has its own negative consequences. So we would be open to, as part of this review, I suppose, to look at all the types of ways that we can engage, depending on the type of the project. Okay, thank you. Uh, just having a look at the optimum bias, which was mentioned earlier on, I think you indicated it came from a sort of Whitehall equation or something along those lines, was it? It was set by somebody in London, potentially, for contracts. Uh, but again, in, in other places, that optimum bias seems to be in around sort of 2 to 5 per cent. Seems to be a lot of the contracts here is in around 8 to 10 per cent. Is that just an opportunity to hide 
where there are monies that may be or not, well, but probably will be used, but it doesn't appear. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be yeah. right in saying that? Or? Uh, I, think this, I think it goes back to this single point estimating against the project off. The, the danger with this type of approach is that, um, that that becomes the, the level that you can spend to. Yeah. So it's designed as, as a way of taking the project forward when you don't have all the, the relevant information, but as you go through the project. But why is it so high in Northern Ireland or UK and yet in Europe you're probably talking I, I suggest it's probably half of what the percentage would be? That maybe needs, again, as part of this process. I think, yeah, the, the, I think the, yeah. New, the new business case process yeah. will actually help with a lot of this. Um, and uh, I don't know why um, it's higher here than other places, but extremely high. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> but um, I think that the, the the new business case process definitely will um, help with help with this. And actually, you know, people, the work that will go on to actually get the costings right yeah. um, more at the outset will, I think, reduce reduce all reduce of that. The yeah. And just on the point you were talking about incentivising uh, contractors, the Crown Commercial Service in you know in the Cabinet Office do use incentivisation of contracts. And they do them. They use them quite regularly, particularly where they're looking for uh, a contract. You know, it cannot go. It cannot be extended in time or in money. And I think that is something that we are looking at with them to see what we can. You know, what we can take of what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have one more question? Uh, again, planning was mentioned as a as a <laughs> cause of delay, and I think there's only three actually in our list here on the on the screen to tell us that planning was an actual cause. I take it there is now a, a format of, of pre-planning consultation takes place, a, a long lead-in to the application actually is submitted, trying to make a shorter turnaround time. Is that has that been happening, or is, is that fair to say that that's what should be happening? Or well, in, in terms of the the, the project that CPD supports, we, we've had good success by, yeah. by being in early and talking to the planners about particular issues. Um, so that's built into our project management processes to, to try and recognise planning issues and, and to speak to planners as soon as possible. Yeah, I sure. understand probably those three, and particularly maybe yeah. casement and that, had more deep, more complicated mm -hmm. issues which emerge probably during the yeah. process. But thank you for thanks for your answer. Okay. Just in, in the, the line of question that uh, Mr Hillage has been pursuing there, last week we heard a considerable amount of emphasis from the Construction Employers Federation about slow process, time lags mm -hmm. uh, in terms of outline business cases and tenders being awarded. Given, um, Ms Gray, that um, Mr Armstrong and his organisation is accountable to you around these issues, what targets have you set to ensure that this is delivered more efficiently and effectively? So um, we have, uh, you know, this is work in progress. Um, we are first of all, you know, I think we do accept that there is something about us being more, being more transparent about the times that people, you know, that we will deal with things, setting targets, and actually being very transparent about them. We haven't done that up until now, but that is a piece of work that we have actually got underway that we have been talking about. I do think the public. Uh, contractors, whoever is whoever are dealing with us, there will always be some exceptions. Some things will always take a bit longer, but I do think people should have an expectation of the time it will take for, and hold us to account. Actually, um, if we ex, you know if we don't deliver within those timescales, yes. that is a piece of work that we've got yeah. underway. And just following on from that, then, Mr. Sterling, uh, um, we accept. Uh, and I want to be absolutely fair that you know these these large. Uh, contracts are complex and they're high risk. We accept all of that. But can I ask you, what are the top three things that you have taken out of this whole process to ensure that we don't arrive at this point again? I think the uh, the top three things that um, would reduce the risk of cost and budget <laughs> overruns in the future, uh, I would guess, would be Let's get multi-year budgets and secure long-term funding in place. Um, let's uh, make sure that we enshrine the new um, uh, business case process so that we have a much more robust approach to uh, forecasting the cost of um, projects at the outset. Um, let's continue to professionalise the um, 
project management and procurement and construction professions. Um, and I'm, if I'm allowed a fourth, um, <laughs> I look forward to seeing the CNAG's report on the judicial review and planning process. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all look forward to seeing that, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Harvey. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mrs. Cray, <clears throat> you're coming relatively new to the various issues in Northern Ireland and are seeing things with fresh eyes. It's exciting. What is your view on the reports from SIB, CBI and OECD and do you agree with their conclusions? So, um, first of all, I am actually loving being here and uh, I am loving the job um, and I have learnt an awful lot. I have learnt a lot um, uh, about, about, by being here and I think there, there are definitely in those reports um, there is a bit of a common theme uh, throughout those reports, and I think they've all been the issues that we've touched upon today. Um, I think that I am in a very fortunate position in that, you know, I have got uh, colleagues in Whitehall who are very keen to support us here, and I'm able to tap into that. At the same time, I think there are things that we are doing here that we are able to show them as well about good things that we are doing. Um, and often, you know, we've been, we've been working with them as well because sometimes, you know, we're a bit smaller here um, and we can actually trial some things for them and pilot and work with them. So um, I think there are, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing currently um, is responding to those reports. And uh, I'm actually feeling, I feel very excited actually about the work that we are doing and where we're going. Um, and, uh, but I think there are, there are good things going on here as well, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, uh, but we can never stop learning. Okay, thank you. And one of the key issues for the civil service in Whitehall is to improve the pace and to the way that it works. Do you think there is a problem in the civil service here in terms of the pace of work? And what ideas would you have to improve the pace of delivery of these projects? So I think we all want to see... Um, <laughs> <laughs> we all want to see pace. Um, I think that uh, uh, you know we do, we do need to get we do need to deliver at pace. Um, and uh, I think that some of the issues that we've outlined today around you know like the let's say the senior responsible owners, the transparency around what they are required to do, the targets <coughs> that you have you know you've suggested that we have got we're looking at. All of those things, I think, will drive pace. Yeah. Um, but I think that all of us, and I think, to be fair, people in the NICS as well, want to see us delivering at pace. And I don't think any of us would... Uh, one of my uh, former bosses, um, a guy called Gus O'Donnell, uh, now Lord O'Donnell, had introduced the four Ps uh, when he was the Cabinet Secretary. And, you know, they were pace, professionalism... Pride, and I cannot remember the fourth one. Passion. passion, passion, and I actually think that is what we, that is what we feel are the four, the four P's are very appropriate to us, and I think they are four very good descriptors of where we want to be in the NICS today. Absolutely, and we really do. You know, Mr. Lund actually very helpfully pointed out that I think it was Lisburn Council had yeah. 27 or so live judicial reviews. Last, you know, we just need to make sure that as we manage risk, that we don't become risk averse yeah. and uh, lose pace, and that has to be key to everything we do as we go forward. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. No, no, I know. I'm, I'm just loving it. So <laughs> great to have you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the um, time you've taken today. Um, we accept and we agree, Ms. Cray, that there are good things going on here. We want to see that continue and at pace as well. Yeah. This isn't this session isn't about, you know, giving a kicking to the civil service or public bodies. Yeah. We want to see that efficiency and that energy and the and the passion that you talk about um, actually coming into the expenditure of public monies to yeah. de deliver value for money and the large projects are delivered on time and on budget. Yeah. And we minimise the you know the loss in terms of that. Um, but having said all of that, uh, and we are all on the same page, to make Northern Ireland PLC the place we wanted to be, and the success that it is uh, going forward, we have listened today. We remain, I have to say, deeply concerned at, at the figures that we heard earlier on. 
there are ongoing issues with, with and live issues in terms of some of the projects that are that are still under construction. Uh, and I would just want to say at the end and the conclusion of this session that I, I do hope we hope that the, there are lessons being learnt around these issues, uh, and that you know perhaps when you come back at a future point, we will be looking at a very different scenario. Um, but we urgently need to deal with these delays and the processes that lead to them so that we can eradicate or reduce the overruns and the overspends and deliver absolute value for money in terms of the, the expenditure of the taxpayer. Yeah. You may not be put here the next time you're coming, I suppose. Is that the, the thing that you're, you're, ho you're hoping? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed. No, all thank, thank, you. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, I would propose at this stage, if you're content, that we take a short comfort break for um, five, ten minutes, if that's okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme sound.